Hi. Um, thanks so much for coming. I'm sorry we're starting a little late. We uh, are a victim of our own popularity, it seems like. So we're trying to get people settled, but we're going to get started, and people will kind of trickle in and, and maybe trickle out a little bit as well. So thanks for your patience. Um, first of all, welcome, and thank you for coming today um, for a debate on America's foreign policy under the current Trump administration. Uh, we proposed this idea to Alumni Relations months ago, and it's only become more timely since. Um, we were just making sure nothing has happened in the last 15 minutes that would totally change <laughs> the tenor of today's debate. Um, first of all, this debate has two sponsors. The first is the student organization Women in International Affairs, um, a new initiative dedicated to building a community of graduate student women who aspire to enter careers in international affairs. WIA provides opportunities for women to discuss current affair, issues in international affairs, network with professionals across the country, and receive guidance and mentorship. And the co-founders are Nicole beckman Tessel, who's an undergrad, a graduate of the college in 2007, uh, so an alum, and also currently a history graduate student, and Ria Mahanta, a Committee on International Relations MA student. They're gonna be at the reception after this debate, so you'll have an opportunity to talk to them. The second sponsor is CIR, the Committee on International Relations. CIR is the country's oldest graduate program in international relations. Um, senior lecturer Matthias Stache, who's in the doorway of CIR, is the guiding light of this whole event and put it together. Uh, CIR is not only the nation's oldest graduate program in IR, but it's also a key part of Chicago's historic strength in the study of international relations. Uh, I'm the, the faculty director, so if I can just boast, we just entered, we cracked for the first time, the t Foreign Policy Magazine's top 10 MA programs in international relations. We're like this tiny shoestring operation outside of Washington and New York, and we're moving up in the world. Um, <laughs> so that's my boast, and, and, and I'll stop. Um, the real stars today are our two debaters, who are rising stars in the study of international relations. They're both assistant professors of political science. Uh, Paul Post, on my right, is the author of Organizing Democracy, How International Organizations Assist New Democracies for Sale on Your Way to the Reception at the Desk. He also just got another book accepted at Cornell University Press on Military Alliance Formation. Austin Carson is also an assistant professor. He has a forthcoming book from Princeton University Press called Secret Wars, Covert Conflict in International Politics. So I think you can pre-order the book if you're so inclined. Uh, both have published many, many journal articles. They've also both won major disciplinary awards for their research. So these guys are, are on the way up. All right, so what are we gonna be doing? We're gonna be debating the virtues and vices of Donald Trump's foreign policy. Paul has volunteered, perhaps in a contrarian manner, to take the pro, arguing that Donald Trump has, in fact, advanced American interests and the interests of its allies abroad. Austin will be arguing against the resolution here. So how are we gonna do this? First, a caveat. Um, anything involving the Trump administration is very polarizing. So I just wanna be clear that neither speaker is necessarily reflecting his own personal beliefs. All right? So we're trying to make, we set this up as a debate to try to get the sharpest arguments and the clearest claims both for and against, but this is not like a partisan cable news yelling type thing, right? <laughs> just yet. FYI for not the yet. crowd. Uh, Austin just said not yet, so. <laughs> I may lose control of this debate, and if so, I apologize in advance. There will be wine afterwards. <laughs> Second, each is gonna make an opening statement. Now, during this opening statement, you'll notice when you sat down, you should have a pen and two note cards. One note card is to write a question that will be brought, collected in the aisle by some of our students and brought to me. Um, so please do that in the first 20 minutes, the first two opening statements. Um, they'll give opening statements, do cross-examinations, and then, I'm gonna do a, a quick moderated q and I'm gonna pick three or four questions from the crowd. Um, this is not the only opportunity to ask questions. We'll all go to the reception <laughs> afterwards. And we'd love to chat about this stuff. Um, and so they're gonna answer questions from the crowd that I'm curating. Then there'll be conclusions. Then the other note card is to vote uh, on what you think. Some of you may have made your minds up already, and you know that's fine, but hopefully in the next hour we'll at least give you some food for thought. All right? And, um, Fourth and finally, there's gonna be a reception, as I mentioned afterward, from five to six, or maybe more like 5.15 to six at this point. And we'd love to have you join us. We're happy to talk about foreign policy, international relations, the University of Chicago, basically anything. So we're gonna start 10 minutes for each. Paul Post, you are up. Excellent. And I will give you time signals as appropriate. Yes, All right. that sounds great. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes, yes. okay. So yes, I am arguing the pro-Trump foreign policy position. And the way I'd like to do this is I want to start by talking about a U.S. president 
who was dismissive of NATO allies, appointed John Bolton to a prominent foreign policy position, pulled the US out of a major environmental treaty, enacted tariffs against a host of major trading partners, used aggressive rhetoric against Iran and North Korea due to their pursuit of nuclear weapons, passed legislation that bolstered the fortifications between the US and Mexico border, and saw a close personal relationship with Vladimir Putin. I'm of course talking about George W. Bush, but we're not here to talk about George W. Bush. Instead, we should talk about a president who made a name for himself in the media industry, uh, pursued policies that led NATO allies to openly question US commitment to the alliance, used belligerent rhetoric to challenge a nuclear armed state that bordered US allies, started a trade war with a major economic power in the East Asian region, directly supported groups, both external and internal, who opposed Iran's regime, sought tighter security measures at the US-Mexico border, and pursued a close personal relationship with the leader of Russia. I'm, of course, talking about Ronald Reagan. My point is that if we focus on the foreign policies pursued by the Trump administration, it's not hard to see that Trump is pursuing a foreign policy typical of modern Republican presidents. In a phrase, recent Republican presidents, including Trump, have pursued what Walter Russell Meade would label a Jacksonian foreign policy. And given by the portrait that's up in the Oval Office, I think Trump would embrace that label. A Jacksonian foreign policy is a type of assertive, even aggressive, unilateralism. It is based on the notion of maintaining American primacy with no equals, no permanent friends, and no permanent enemies. According to this form of foreign policy, other nations are told to follow or get out of the way, but the US is going to take the lead in the way that suits the United States. While this manner of conducting, conducting foreign policy is named after Andrew Jackson, in many ways, it harkens back to a core early statement of US foreign policy, George Washington's farewell address. In that address, Washington wrote, it is folly in one nation to look for disinterested favors from another. There can be no greater error than to expect or calculate upon real favors from nation to nation. It is an illusion which experience must cure, which just pride ought to discard. Stated differently, Washington didn't want a sense of obligation to treaties, or reciprocity to other countries to constrain America's ability to be a global power. The rationale is that America must be unbound, able to do what is in its national interests to pursue policies that strengthen America relative to other countries without regard for how it might alter short-term relations with one nation or another. So that, in my view, is the framework one has to take for seeing that there is indeed a logic in the foreign policy pursued by the Trump administration. It's raw, and mistakes have been and will continue to be made, as they're made in any administration. But it's not unre it is not unreasonable, and it follows from a long tradition. So broadly, the Republican foreign policy, this aggressive unilateralism, this Jacksonian unilateralism, and Trump's foreign policy in particular has three traits. Trait number one, treating allies as secondary options, not equal partners. Relatedly, approaching international organizations and treaties with a healthy dose of skepticism. For example, in the case of the Iranian nuclear deal, Trump was willing to go against the wishes of US allies by withdrawing from the agreement. From the perspective of the Trump administration, this was, this was a necessary punishment to Iran for continuing to pursue policies that the United States perceives as destabilizing to the region, such as support for al-Assad's regime in Syria or support for Hezbollah against Israel. Now, one could argue that the US could have conducted that type of punishment and stayed in the deal. 
But from the Trump administration's perspective, they opted for what you could call an omnibus approach. Put everything on the table, start over again. Trait number two, using tariffs, not just as a means of protecting domestic industry, but as an instrument of foreign policy leverage. From concerns over China stealing US intellectual property to an oversupply of steel in the global market, buoyed by subsidies from foreign governments to their manufacturers, imposing tariffs was not a beyond the pale response. Again, one might claim that there were more collaborative means of addressing these concerns because the reality is there's actually little controversy that there's an oversupply of steel in the global economy. The debate is over what's the appropriate means of addressing it. But the Trump administration perceives that unilateral imposition of tariffs is a useful means of putting the US in the driver's seat for renegotiating the terms of various trade deals. Trade number three, a willingness to use tough rhetoric towards a rival, but then immediately embrace that rival. <laughs> now, some might find Trump's aggressive direct rhetoric towards other leaders and nations to be off-putting, and I'll admit I'm one of those people. But I would argue, knowingly or not, Trump is simply taking a page from the Richard Nixon foreign policy playbook. Nixon developed the, quote, madman theory of foreign policy, end quote. Nixon's chief of staff, H.R. Haldeman, wrote that Nixon had confided in him, and this is Haldeman's words, quoting Nixon, okay? Nixon came to him and said, I call it madman theory, Bob. I want the North Vietnamese to believe I've reached a point where I might do anything to stop the war, this being Vietnam. We'll just slip the word to them that, for God's sake, you know Nixon is obsessed with communism. We can't restrain him from when he's angry. And he has his hand on the nuclear button, right? You say that, this is Nixon to Haldeman, you say that, and Ho Chi Minh himself will be in Paris in two days begging for peace. So in short, Trump's intuition is to follow a Jacksonian foreign policy typified by other modern Republican presidents. And I've mentioned here Bush, Reagan, and Nixon. In his and in their view, this will maintain the United States as the world's most influential major power. Now make no mistake, pursuing a Jacksonian assertive unilateralism does not mean pursuing a perfect foreign policy. Mistakes will be made. Mistakes have been made. But a Jacksonian assertive unilateralism is, in Trump's view, and in the view of many thinkers of the Jacksonian tradition, key to maintaining the US as the dominant power on the global stage. Thank you. Okay, um, so we're now gonna have Austin Carson. Please remember, if you have a note card and you have a question, write it down, and after Austin's talk, some students will circulate to grab them and bring them up to me. Okay, Austin. Great, uh, well thanks to the sponsors, thanks to Paul, Matias, and the other organizers, and thanks to all of you for coming. I'll be representing the position today opposing uh, the wisdom of the Trump administration's foreign policy. And I wanna start by acknowledging that the question of the merits of Trump's foreign policy is obviously complex. It's obviously thorny and it's quite politically treacherous. And building on Paul's opening comments, I think our job today is to separate the pedestrian from the exceptional. That is, separating the aspects of Trump's foreign policy, which are essentially rebranded traditional conservative foreign policy, uh, with those that are truly unique. And I hope to convince you that the unusual, exceptional elements of uh, the Trump foreign policy are not a mere matter of impulsive tweets or of uh, uh, un unsavory rhetoric, uh, but are actually quite dangerous. And to do this, I'm gonna focus on two specific areas, because I think the specifics matter. Um, nuclear proliferation and international trade. Uh, and in each of those areas, I'm gonna do two things. First, I'm gonna identify what I think is exceptional, uh, what a previous Republican president, to sort of invoke Paul's um, intellectual exercise, would look at and say, I don't know if I would agree with that. And secondly, I'll explain why those differences matter. 
how those features are quite sensible when you understand Trump's uh, individual psychology and the people he's appointed to positions of power in his administration, and how those features could make things like nuclear proliferation or rules-based international trade a lot worse in a very dangerous way, potentially. So at the end of the debate, you can agree with basically everything Paul said in his opening comments. Say, much of Trump foreign policy is traditional conservatism, conservatism dressed up in fiery rhetoric, and that the liberal media oftentimes gets in histrionics about things that if Reagan or Bush did it, nobody would have really raised as much of a, of a stink. But the, we could put a number on that. 80%, let's say, of Trump's foreign policy is in parallel with and echoes the previous uh, Republican presidents. I think the question in this debate, though, is about the other 20%. That is, what makes Trump's foreign policy unique so far, and what that ultimately could do in terms of American security and prosperity. So first, let me talk about nuclear proliferation. So I think everyone can agree, Republican, Democrat, uh, or Independent, that new nuclear arsenals in the hands of unstable, unpredictable leaders is a huge threat to peace and a big, has big implications for American primacy, prosperity, and for American allies. And the Trump White House, as we all know, uh, has tried hard for a win in the nuclear diplomacy realm, um, most obviously in its on again, off again, and I believe as of three hours ago, on again, <laughs> North Korea summit. So what's the 20% here? Okay, what's unique about the Trump administration's uh, activities and initiatives in this area? One word that I want you to think about, and that's verification. So Reagan, to invoke uh, a leading light of the Republican Party, famously said, trust, but verify, in reference to arms control during the Cold War with the Soviet Union. And that phrase became famous and a kind of watchword of nuclear diplomacy because it recognizes that verification, that is going and checking to make sure the promises that countries make about either nonproliferation or disarmament are kept through on the ground and other means of inspection. And one important point is that uh, this is something I've studied in my own research, and verifying non-proliferation, that is, activities of a government that has not yet developed a nuclear weapon, is feasible as long as you have eyes on the ground through inspectors from international bodies or from other countries, and good intelligence. Verifying disarmament, that is, verifying that a country that has developed nuclear weapons has gotten rid of them, is almost impossible. The reason is the bomb in the basement problem. Uh, a small number of nuclear weapons can be easily hid in a bunker or other concealed facility, and only a perfectly accurate and confident baseline. I know this country has 15 nuclear weapons, and I just saw them all go out the back door to be eliminated or destroyed in another country, can ensure that that disarmament pledge uh, has actually been upheld. So why do I talk about this verification? Because I think, arguably, the Trump administration strategy on Iran and North Korea has been exactly backwards. And it's contrary to both sound foreign policy principles of Republican and Democratic presidents. So what do I mean by that? First, take Iran. In Iran, the Trump administration inherited a deal, the JCPOA, a diplomatic deal that while not perfect and not covering all of uh, Iranian foreign policy or all time, did provide eyes on the ground. One of the features of that deal that isn't all that well known is the degree to which Iran agreed to have International Atomic Energy Agency, or IAEA, inspectors crawling all over their country, basically, indefinitely, and to both facilities that were declared before and facilities that were not. And so this was an example of a deal where a country has made a pledge to not develop nuclear weapons, and you actually had the means to verify it. What was the Trump administration's reaction? Flagrant, flagrant, flagrantly reject the US role in the deal, which risks unraveling the delicate bargain that sustains it, and unleashing Iran's ambitions, actually making nuclear proliferation more likely in that country. Now think about North Korea, where I think the situation is the opposite. Here you have a country that already has an arsenal. They've already developed, uh, test, tested six warheads, and are estimated to have in the double digits number of warheads that they could use. Sure, any deal that Trump might strike with North Korea would be historic, ending the Korean War uh, or engaging in some kind of reciprocal uh, confidence building measures would be an incredible improvement over the status quo. But the fact remains that denuclearization is basically unverifiable. North Korea has spent decades developing underground conventional and nuclear and military facilities, knowing full well that US imagery intelligence and its ability to use airstrikes could wipe out any facilities it had not uh, buried underground deeply. So there's many options, many bunkers that the North Korean regime can choose to put a few nuclear weapons in case things go south. In the best case scenario, they ship out even 10 nuclear warheads that the international, communi international community can see, uh, but we don't know what about the 11th or about the 12th. 
And the only success stories of verifying existing nuclear states that have disarmed are countries like Ukraine and South Africa. That is after a dramatic regime change in which outsiders were given full access to their facilities. So my point is that the Trump administration has torn up one deal that had verified nonproliferation and is trying to embark on a diplomatic approach to sign a deal which could never be verified. And this contradicts uh, essentially a legacy of decades of foreign policy from different kinds of different parties and different leaders and indicates how Trump's essentially desire to uphold his campaign promises, trashing the Iran deal, and to appear as a deal maker may end up backfiring. Now consider the area of international trade and tariffs. So Paul's right, the Trump White House has been in some ways refreshingly willing to use tariffs or other forms of economic coercion to try to get better economic deals with partners like Mexico, Canada, the EU. So what's new here? What's the 20% the that I, I think is important? Well, it's a relatively uh, specific or, or legal issue, but it's what the justification for tariffs have been uh, by the Trump administration. They've invoked something called the national security exemption, basically saying the flood of imports in their view of steel or now in the last few weeks, automobiles, is a threat to American national security and justifies trade retaliation by the United States. And that looks like no problem at first. It's invoking a law that's been on the books in the US for a long time, and even at the World Trade Organization, the WTO, there is room for invoking national security. But it's actually revolutionary, because that national security exemption has never been exempted or adopted or invoked by a country that's part of the World Trade Organization since it existed. And it functions essentially like the ultimate get out of jail free card. If you don't like the trade uh, dynamics and they're hurting workers or some other group in your country, you just say, this is a national security threat, I'm going to impose tariffs. Well, that looks fine when we're doing it, it doesn't look so fine when other countries do it. And so the precedent that's been set, even if these trade deals are ultimately negotiated, even if NAFTA gets renegotiated to American benefit and Trump the deal maker comes through with a deal he can, he can show and, and parade as, as a, a massive victory, the problem is that you have set a legal precedent to allow countries in any situation to say, national security, uh, Florida oranges, they're a threat to my security, so I'm going to invoke that and impose tariffs. And that's actually what we've done. We've essentially said the importation of German automobiles is a national security threat, which is patently ridiculous and only worsens the fact that they're invoking an exemption nobody's used and doing it in an incredibly implausible way. Well, that just makes it all the more easy for another country down the road to implausibly invoke that same exemption. It's interesting because the George W. Bush administration also raised tariffs, also tried to protect American workers, but they did not use that national security exemption. And when the World Trade Organization deemed those tariffs to be against the international trade rules, international trade rules the United States set up and has helped enforce since 1945, the Bush administration rescinded those tariffs. So we'll see what the Trump administration does, but bottom line is that it appears that they have essentially uh, let the genie out of the bottle in terms of this trade exemption. So to summarize, I think Paul has a great point, which is that the differences are exaggerated between the current president and past presidents. But remember that 20%, not just the 80% of similarity, but the 20% of exceptional aspects and exceptional behavior. And this isn't really a debate about historical novelty, it's about whether or not those differences are good for American prosperity, American security. And I think nuclear uh, proliferation and international trade are two specific examples, and we could do this in other areas if we wanted, uh, in which the answer is that they are worse for American prosperity and security. Thank you. Thanks, Austin. OK, now we get to put our Perry Mason hats on and have cross-examination. So um, we're going to start with uh, Austin cross-examining Paul for five minutes and then reverse it. So Austin, okay. you're up. All right, so I have a simple first question, which is you referenced uh, President Nixon, who I think has rightly been uh, sort of cast out of the uh, Republican pantheon. Um, and you and specifically invoked his madman theory. So my first question is, why is that supposed to be reassuring? The, ma <laughs> the madman theory, the problem with the madman theory is that it is crazy and it doesn't work. For example, North Vietnam, North Vietnam did not come crawling back to the table when the Nixon administration engaged in a madman nuclear alert. They were just confused. They were just like, you're crazy and desperate. What are you doing? So what about that should make us feel any better about Trump's foreign policy? So it's a good question. Yeah, and I think that, and I'm going to say that to all of them. That's a good question, but I have a good answer. I'm pretty sure I have a good Actually, answer. That's a good question. So first of all, you know, it's important to realize that during my remarks, I said, look, mistakes are going to be made. That doesn't, you know, mistakes are going to be made, errors are going to be like, made. I like the passive construction of that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> mistakes, mistakes are mistakes made. Mistakes were made. Mistakes were made. Oops. And, 
And with respect to uh, Nixon utilizing the Madman Theory, I mean, it's important to realize uh, something specific with Nixon, and then we can generalize it. So specific with Nixon is, on the one hand, yes, he was trying to use this as a policy towards specifically North Vietnam, but he had a larger audience than that, right? He had China as part of his audience. He had the Soviet Union as part of his audience. And so even though it may have sowed confusion within North Vietnam, it's hard to argue that it didn't play some role in helping to create the conditions by which Nixon was then able to go to China, right? Mm -hmm. And actually start to develop relations. That's why it was so shocking when Nixon was suddenly able to go to China, is other presidents couldn't do that because other presidents weren't perceived as this crazy lunatic who no one wants to mess with. And then all of a sudden you see this crazy lunatic showing up in China. And he's like, oh no, these guys are great. And suddenly relations are terrific with them. So I think that that's the aspect of it that can be useful, that even if it doesn't necessarily work in one context, which yeah. I actually think it might be working here, the broader audience, it can be effective. Okay. so I. I'm not sure I agree that the Nixon to China diplomatic initiative reflects the madman theory so much as Nixon and Kissinger having a particular appreciation for geopolitics and the triangular game between the US and Soviets and engaging in careful, painstaking, effective diplomatic uh, uh, ground laying before they went to China and reopened relations with them. That to me is well executed diplomacy. That's not the madman theory. Now, my second question has to do with the the, the, the liberal international order, a term that's being thrown around you know, every Tuesday these days, um, and its relationship to American hegemony and American primacy. So um, I think something that both uh, John Eikenberry, a liberal institutionalist in our field who has uh, focused a lot on international organizations, and a John Mearsheimer, our colleague here at the University of Chicago and uh, one of the most well-known realists in the world, would agree that the liberal order was created, the liberal order that I think the Trump administration is, is potentially undermining, that that liberal order was created by the United States for the United States, okay? The rule-based international trade system based on free trade to the United States' advantage, okay? The nuclear non-proliferation treaty, just to return to the two t things I talked about, created essentially by the US and the Soviet unions Soviet Union to create a, uh, a cartel of countries that have nuclear weapons, the ultimate weapon that humans have ever created, and most countries don't get it. Guess who that benefits? The United States. So my question is, why do you think Trump's deviation from past Republican presidents, past Republican presidents like George H.W. Bush and to a certain extent Reagan and George W. Bush, who have embraced the international liberal order as a means to maintaining America's position in the world, why do you think that approach is unwise now? Why abandon the system, the rules of the road that the U.S. wrote to its benefit, basically? Why, why abandon those now? Should I say it again? Good question. Yes, that's yes. right. No. Um, also true. And also true, <laughs> yes. My remark to this, my answer to this is actually pretty simple. Um, Yes, the U.S. played a role in creating these institutions and establishing these treaties. Um, but the U.S., throughout the Cold War and following the Cold War, in no way ever felt bound by them. We can go through case after case after case after case where the U.S. disregarded the U.N., disregarded NATO allies, disregarded trade provisions, and in many ways created these institutions more as a way to kind of constrain other states rather than constraining the United States, United States itself. And so my counter argument would be that the US has, has always, even after creating these institutions, still pursued a very unilateral foreign policy. Okay, Paul, you get right. to return the favor. All right, terrific. So, so you brought up about the, specifically we're gonna focus on, to start off with the Iran and North Korea policy. Right, you brought up both of these, and, and, and rightfully brought up about the trust but verify. And I've even said many times this is one of the difficulties with kind of like using weapons inspectors because you can hide a lot of things in many places. But what I would say is that, first of all, isn't the policy that you're advocating? You use the term legacy, but I would use the term insanity. Right? Because insanity, the definition of it is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. And we're not seeing a different result with respect to North Korea and Iran. So isn't the appropriate approach to finally take a different approach with those countries? 
Um, <clears throat> I think, I guess I, my first part of my answer would be I don't agree that we're doing the same thing with Iran over and over again and expecting different results. I think the Iran deal, uh, while not a perfect deal by any means, and certainly not a comprehensive deal, was a radical break with the past. Um, and I think as a result of that deal, uh, you have a bunch of things happening, but one of them is that you essentially have technical experts from the IAEA all crawling all over the nuclear facilities in Iran, gathering all kinds of information. And one of the great things that happens when you do that is that if a country like Iran breaks out of its deal, or if the deal expires and Iran decides to resume its exploration of nuclear weapons or its pursuit of nuclear weapons, now you know all kinds of stuff about what they've got, what they had, and what they could do on what timeline and where. And so I would see, uh, uh, you know, maybe we can agree that the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. But I think the Obama administration, for all its flaws, did a good job on negotiating a new kind of deal, and we got a new kind of behavior, which is that Iran's nuclear program is essentially and effectively frozen, and it will have indefinitely, okay, parts of the deal expire in, in eight years, but indefinitely it will have an obligation to allow those inspectors all over its country. Um, so that's a different outcome. Uh, as for North Korea, I'm not going to lie. I'm not really sure what to do about North Korea. <laughs> um, but I, I'll tell you what I wouldn't do, which is um, remove all the sanctions and all the isolation that have been built up over decades of Republican and Democratic presidents uh, in return for a vague promise to denuclearize, which, as I said, is almost literally impossible to verify unless you allow thousands and thousands and thousands of foreigners to crawl over North Korea's military sites and hope that you found all the underground layers they built um, that they might be able to, to hide things away. So I think that uh, I'm worried that tr the Trump administration and its eagerness to find a deal will, um, will sign an agreement in which two, the two sides mean different things by denuclearize, and no matter what they mean by it, it, it is impossible to verify that. And now you've got a North Korea which has all kinds of access to resources uh, with the same nuclear arsenal that it had before, and you have lost most of your leverage. So just as a quick counter to that, I guess I'd like to hear your reaction to this, um, is I would argue that with North Korea, you know, there was, of course, a lot of talk lately about the Libya model, right, and about how that was put out there and probably not the best thing to have been said. But the model that I think is actually more hopeful and would point to the, the benefit of raising sanctions and actually improving relations would be the South African model. Right? That this is a country that gave up its nuclear weapons at the same time that sanctions were raised because of the apartheid regime. And so would you say, I would argue that that is actually the model they're aiming for. It's a fantasy because the model is based on regime change first, then denuclearization. So when I, in, in my own opening comments, I said the only two examples of successful verified denuclearization, countries that had nuclear weapons that got rid of them and now we're confident they don't have them, was after their regime changed. That was after apartheid was overthrown and the African Af National Congress took power in South Africa. Okay, if you get North Korea to, change, to overthrow Kim Jong-un and put in some reasonable leaders, let's go, let's do it. But that's not what's happening. And in fact, negotiating this deal may make that far, far less likely if Kim Jong-un is blessed by the international community as a legitimate leader and has nearly infinite resources because sanctions were lifted. 30 seconds. 30 seconds on tariffs. Yes. So you brought up that obviously the Trump administration is now using a national security motivation versus a safeguard motivation. But wouldn't you argue that this is just simply learning? That they learned that, hey, if we use a safeguard, it's going to get vetoed in WTO, so we need to go with this other provision. I think uh, you could say that it's learning. It's definitely uh, an alternative that will work differently than the past. I think it might be learning the wrong lesson and weighing the wrong consequences in that they are looking at what will be expedient in the short term to coerce through tariffs and not thinking about how this same ex exception can be claimed by other countries down the road when they want to retaliate because Florida oranges are a threat to their security. Okay. Thank you. So thank you for all the questions. If any of you want a master's degree, just staple a couple of these together and talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're, they're really excellent. And I'm, I can only do a subset, but we're around afterwards to, to answer anything we didn't get to. Uh, these were the ones for Paul Post. Um, these three were for the con side, which <laughs> maybe gives a sense of the balance of the room, or maybe not. Maybe persuasion is at work. So I'm going to start with Paul, okay? Um, Paul Post. The Trump administration has made little secret of its lack of interest in immigration, democracy, science and technology, the knowledge economy, right? Kind of what we might think of as soft values. 
why shouldn't we be deeply concerned about the implications of the Trump administration's rhetoric and policies on these dimensions for both the U.S.'s international reputation, but also for the vitality of its economy and society at home? No, so, again, whoever asks, that's a good question. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it, the question does point to something that a lot of people talk about, this is notion of soft power, right? You know, kind of uh, uh, invoking Joseph Nye, the idea that you have hard power and you have soft power. Hard power being mil basically military power and economic coercion. Soft power being more of this like persuasion that you know, kind of alluring people to you because of the policies you pursue, the ideals you uphold, and so forth. Be it democracy, human rights, and so forth. And so to me, that question really points to is what the Trump administration doing kind of undermining U.S. soft power. Right, and is hard power enough to make up for that, to be able to maintain US primacy? And my answer to that would be that the reality is that the, the lesson that's been drawn, that the United States, I would say, is drawn, and if the Trump administration is looking at past Republican and Democratic presidents, is that hard power at the end of the day wins out. And that there might be policies that are pursued that could undermine US soft power, but if the Trump administration is taking measures to use economic and military coercion, that's in line with what the United States has done throughout the era of the liberal institutional order. Okay, so um, Austin, you kind of got multiple variants of the same question, which, which touch on what you were just talking about. So I'm hoping you can kind of move beyond your last comments on North Korea. So the basic questions I'm gonna to try to summarize is, on North Korea in particular, right? Maybe the madman posture is actually working. Kim Jong-un certainly adopted a madman posture. It's worked great for him so far, right? So what exactly, is, is this just media overreaction to Trump? If Barack Obama was doing the exact same things, would the New York Times be writing the same kind of editorials? Or is in fact North Korea kind of a risky but plausible strategy in the face of a very, very difficult problem? I guess my answer to that is I agree with most of it, um, but I don't think it, it addresses the fundamental structural problem with the deal with North Korea. So I think I would concede that Obama would not be able to conduct the kind of um, sort of rapidly moving, uh, vacillating, but I think in a, actually kind of a strategically crazy like a fox kind of way. Um, I don't think Obama could do that. I don't think Kim Jong-un would negotiate in the same way with Obama. I think Trump brings a lot of good things to the table in terms of negotiating strategy. My point is that no matter how, many, how much skill you bring to the table, you sit down and the big elephant in the room is that this country has nuclear weapons, number one, and number two, no matter what they say, you can't verify that they got rid of those nuclear weapons. So the premise of this diplomacy, uh, this diplomatic deal to me is flawed. And I, so I think that you can give all, all credit due and you can say, yeah, the New York Times would probably be heralding this as Obama's greatest effort to use his charisma to, to negotiate a deal with North Korea. But I still think that people who study issues of nonproliferation verification and North Korea experts would say they have a bomb, it could be spirited into the basement and we won't know. So be very careful what you negotiate and be very careful what you sign on to. The thing that Trump will do that I don't think Obama would is Trump is so eager for a win and is so eager to look like a deal maker, he may be willing to take a denuclearization pledge as some sort of token gift when in fact it's, uh, it means very different things and uh, is unverifiable at, at root. <clears throat> okay, so I'm gonna ask both of you the same question. Um, and I'm gonna paraphrase a really interesting question that came up here. How much does Donald Trump as an individual actually matter here, right? What about his personality, his Twitter feed, the way he talks, right? If we took the exact same policies and we planted them on, you know, Jeb Bush or whoever, right, would be you be equally as excited or equally as worried or not, right? So, uh, Paul, why don't we start with you? Okay. Yeah. So the this also gets to another big issue that's being addressed by a lot of IR scholars. You know, the last question mentioned soft power versus hard power. This is that there's been a a whole slew of articles and research been done lately about the role of leaders. You know, do leaders matter? Under what conditions do leaders matter? What traits, if they've had military experience, if they were a second child, all these kind of things, right? These are all things that they look at, <laughs> you know, to determine, you know, what makes them effective. And what has been found so far is that there, it does make a difference on the margins, right? That the first thing is first, which is power, uh, military power, hard power, 
the, what realist scholars would call, or even non-realists would call, the structure of the international system. How many major powers are there, the distribution of that. But that doesn't determine the foreign policy. Kenneth Waltz even said, that's just a theory of, the theory of international politics is not a theory of foreign policy. So, but within that constraints, now you have some movement to make decisions. And at that point, leadership does matter, right? And so if you are faced, if the structure of the system allows you to follow option A or option B, now it matters what the leader decides to do. So in that sense, I think the leader matters in terms of choosing the options. But I don't think the leader actually generates the options. So you haven't used the word Donald Trump yet. No. Could you address Donald Trump for us? Can I address Donald Trump then? I would, that was yeah. the question. <laughs> and so I would say that what Donald Trump is doing is, aside from the rhetoric, aside from the rhetoric, aside from the rhetoric, he's pursuing a policy that I think, uh, the phrase I like to use is replacement level Republican. Right? So for you baseball fans out there, basketball, you know what I'm talking about, right? Which is that if you remove Donald Trump and replaced him with any other Republican, I think you would see a very similar foreign policy. Different rhetoric, for sure, but very similar foreign policy. Austin? I think it's a great question, and, <clears throat> um, and I would echo Paul's comments that this is a, an area of research that's uh, in our line of business is uh, getting a lot of attention lately that I think is, is only gonna be helped by uh, at least the perception that Donald Trump is a singular uh, president in American history. Um, I think my position would be that, yes, I think Trump and the unique aspects of Trump do matter. Um, and I think I want to agree with Paul that I'm not going to hang my hat on, you know, fiery rhetoric, the way he talks. Let's just, let's just imagine that doesn't matter, okay? I do think it matters, but I don't want to, I don't want to uh, die on that hill, so to speak. So one thing I think is unique about Donald Trump and, and sort of cashes out in one of the things I talked about in my opening comments is campaign promises. So this is a little bit about uh, uh, how he talks, but it's specific policy positions he took in his campaign. Uh, he, in a, in a singular way, in a way Jeb Bush never would have, uh, came out extremely aggressively against the Iran deal, uh, called it the worst deal that's ever been signed in history, the typical hyperbole he uses. But he also came out in favor of a lot of other things, like the wall. And I think so. The, one of the individual things that matter, one of the unique things about Trump that matters is his path to power was very unique. And that means once he's in office, uh, what he thinks will reward him politically is going to be very different than what other replacement level Republican presidents would think uh, would reward them. Uh, and the other thing I would say is that the, the existing, uh, uh, this growing research in our, our field on this also points to a different way that individuals matter and not just Donald J. Trump. It would be the advisors he appoints. So if you look at somebody like John Bolton, um, you know, that's a person whose uh, role in, in uh, nuclear nonproliferation and nuclear diplomacy uh, for the Trump White House uh, is something that could be very, uh, very dangerous in terms of the diplomacy with North Korea and with how the Iran, uh, sort of the aftermath of the pullout of the Iran deal ultimately works out. So I think we'll, we'll have sort of a case study not only of the president but of the president's leading advisors um, being uh, really important for, for the path that, uh, that this foreign policy takes. Great. How much prep time do you guys want? We could do up to five minutes to a couple minutes work for you. Yeah, a couple minutes is fine. Let's do, so we'll just sit cool quietly here? and reflect for two minutes. Talk, and then talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> yeah, or, or, you know. And then there will be uh, five minute closing statements. Then you can write your vote, pro or con, on the note card. We'll collect them. And then there will be free food um, <laughs> afterward. So. And wine. You're all that stands between these people and free food to drink. <laughs> Paul is ready to go. Oh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, all right, so it turns out there aren't enough cards because we underestimated demand. So I think we'll do a vote of hand rather than a note card because there are all kinds of people without cards. So at the end, we'll do a, a hand vote. We could do that, but that's just a little more labor intensive. All right, so we're gonna have a closing statement, Paul Post, and then Austin Carson. Paul, all yours. Great, so closing statement, I'm gonna close my statement with actually a remark that was in the news yesterday as well as today and by way of 
partial biography, I'm from Ohio, Southwest Ohio, and actually John Boehner's district is where I grew up. And the reason why I bring that up is John Boehner yesterday, of course, was in the news, he was interviewed, and I read his interview, and you know he had some not so great things to say about Trump, but he also had some su rather supportive things. And what I want to start with is this quote. He wrote, but if, or he said in the interview, but if you can peel away the noise and the tweets and all that, which is virtually impossible. <laughs> he acknowledged that. Virtually impossible. But if you peel, this, peel all this away from a Republican standpoint, the things he's doing, by and large, are really good things." End quote. So Trump's intuition is to follow a Jacksonian foreign policy typified by other modern Republican presidents, as I said before. And in his view and others, this is the key to maintain the United States as the most influential power in the world. As I said, mistakes will be made and a Jacksonian, assertive, unilateral foreign policy is not a perfect foreign policy. But by following this assertive Jacksonian unilateralism, Trump is enabling the US to be unbound, able to do what is in its national interests, to pursue policies that strengthen America relative to other countries. That's the key phrase there, relative to other countries. It could do some harm to the United States, but the thinking is, under this form of foreign policy, it will do more harm to other nations. And to do so without regard for how it might alter short-term relations with one nation or another. And so to close once again with George Washington, which is really where this foreign policy has its basis, he talked about not having entangling alliances not having permanent friends or permanent foes. Some people have interpreted that as a call for isolationism, but that wasn't what Washington was talking about. He's saying, no, the U.S. needs to be assertive. The U.S. needs to be engaged in the world, but the U.S. needs to do it on its terms. Thank you. All right, well, thanks. Uh Paul, for a wonderful debate, and uh, this has been a fascinating conversation. Um, and I think I want to start by reminding you of my 80-20 formulation, okay? Mm -hmm. One way I think about what Paul's position has been in this debate is a bit like if we were debating, and please follow, this is a little bit of an extended analogy. If we were debating whether or not to feed my three-year-old son ice cream for every meal for the rest of his life. Okay, so I'm going to be against that. Paul's going to be in favor of that. Paul's position is ice cream is kind of like other foods, right? <laughs> it has cream in it, it's cold, um, and it tastes good. My position is, yeah, okay, sure, it, it, it does have some similarities with other foods. It also has a lot of sugar. And so if you feed my three-year-old ice cream for every meal, like, have fun. You can take care of him. I don't want him. <laughs> okay, so the point is that the novelty of Trump vis-a-vis -vis previous president, presidents is not really what we're here to debate. What we're here to debate is whether or not the things the Trump administration has done are good for American prosperity and security or not. And I think that 20%, that sort of the sugar in the ice cream or for Trump, some of the things I pointed to in the nuclear proliferation or uh, international trade realms, that 20% matters a lot. He is different than past Republican presidents and it's not just rhetoric. And I think those differences uh, have significant implications. So as I said, it's not rhetoric, it's policy. These are premeditated choices. Nobody just like, he didn't just fall off the side of his bed and say, I'm gonna invoke the national security uh, exception to impose these tariffs. That was a calculated maneuver in consultation with his trade advisors. And so this isn't just rhetoric, it isn't just impulsivity or a tweet. This is specific, the things I have pointed to are specific policy choices they've made. And to remind you, in the nuclear proliferation realm, I think they've got policy backwards. On an Iran, they had an Iran deal that they inherited, which, while not perfect, did have strong verification measures and would prevent Iran from developing a nuclear weapon, fundamentally changing its trajectory, in my view, um, indef almost indefinitely, um, and if not indefinitely, buying a lot of time and a lot of information should they, uh, for some reason, decide to reverse course. Uh, on North Korea, of course, they are uh, eager to try to find a deal, but one which I think structurally, regardless of all the details, can't be verified in terms of denuclearization. 
and yet that eagerness to get a deal, something that is unique to Trump and something that I think may trap him into and his advisors into supporting uh, a deal that's not in American interests on North Korea. And then on international trade, it's, it's something of a technical issue, but invoking this national security exemption sets a really dangerous precedent. precedent. As I said, it's kind of letting the genie out of the bottle. And it allows any country down the road who thinks that even something as obscure or silly as Florida oranges are a national security threat to them, they can now cite that as a justification for their tariffs against us. And then people who work in that industry in Florida are out of a job. So in the short term, it makes a lot of sense. It's a good way to not fall into the trap that the George W. Bush administration fell into, to wield tariffs as a coercive tool, but it has major implications down the road, and in some uh, views, unraveling the very system of rules we've created. We have uh, lead it, led the creation of um, uh, on international trade. So I guess I'd close with sort of a classic aphorism of war, which is that the victors get to write the rules. The victors get to, to settle the peace in their, in their preference. And that's exactly what the United States did at the end of World War II. It created a set of rules in the international system, which while oftentimes described in benign universalistic terms, people who study history and study international relations will quickly tell you were carefully calibrated to favor American national interests. And the problem with the Trump administration in my view is that that 20%, that difference with past Republican presidents, that embrace of an aggressive unilateralism has gone too far. It's just too much. It's walking away from diplomatic deals where there were strong verification measures, trust but verify, in the spirit of Reagan and rejecting it because it just is tainted by Obama's legacy. And it's undermining potentially the trade uh, system that we play a leading role in creating to facilitate the growth of our economy over the past five decades. So if you agree with me, then I think we should uh, collectively uh, render our judgment that the Trump administration's <laughs> foreign policy is unwise rather than wise. And thanks for your attention. Thanks. So let's take a vote. All those in favor of the pro, raise your hands. Okay, all those con? Okay, well the cons have it, but that was a great debate. So let's, <laughs> let's thank our, our debaters. The reception is that way. So please join us.